So it's Patrick's hard act to follow. I don't know if y'all figure that out. <laughs> um, and I will say that there'll be some redundancy. Um, I think that Patrick and I probably come from a similar school of thought. And I'd also say that as a graduate student, I crossed paths with Richard McDonald probably 15 years ago. Um, so, I'll tell you what I do first. So I work for an organization called Bountiful Cities. Um, Bountiful Cities has partner gardens and direct gardens that we take care of. Almost every school, church, and community garden that you know of in the city of Asheville, we have an affiliation here. Um, and so, well, what I do is actually a program of that, where we do the same kind of work that we do in community gardens, we do on private property with homeowners, it's a fee-for-service program called Grass to Greens. Yeah. Um, and so I would say that Bountiful Cities, as a nonprofit organization, and then I think those of us that affiliate with Bountiful Cities, hold up some values. And I think that those values help inform the work that we do and the way that we do it. So those three values are community, justice, and education, which I think in a lot of ways is like what this whole series has been about as well. Um, and so when we, for I mean, I think that I, I'm just going to sort of set aside community and education, um, but speak a little bit more about justice, right? So I think throughout this, throughout this series, that's in a lot of ways what we've been talking about, whether it's farm worker justice, um, but for Bountiful Cities, we break it down into three ways. So economic justice, environmental justice, and social justice. And I think really when we take like a holistic perspective to like our work, in a lot of ways what we're talking about is justice, right? So I also think that it's important to think about some sort of related or extended, extended sort of philosophical or values about resilience and self-reliance. And as Patrick has mentioned, about restoration, right? So we've had significant disturbance all over the place, right? And so we, in a lot of ways, like our work, those of us that are working with the earth, a lot of what we're doing is restoration in disturbed areas, right? So I'm going to share some anecdotes. And some of these um, are from, well, at least this one's from today. So I was at a client's house. He emailed me yesterday and I didn't respond to it because I, like, how could I respond to this question, right? And he says, there's a lot of mosquitoes, can you spray? So I, mean, I get a lot of those kind of questions from clients um, because they're like, you're the guy that comes to my property and works on my landscape, you ought to know the answers to everything. So, but I mean, basically the short answer is, no, I won't spray. You can probably find someone else with less scruples who will come out and spray, but I won't do it. I just won't do it. You know, and I, I like the fact that he was savvy enough to know that I probably need to control the standing water, and clean the gutters, and a few other things, and those things will help control the mosquito population. Another one of my clients recently asked me, you know, we spray Roundup on, the, on my driveway, on my gravel driveway. And so, and, and I, say, I share these anecdotes, I'm talking about in six years of work, if there's only six or seven times that I've had clients ask me to spray. And so the short answer is, yeah, I actually did spray that Roundup in his gravel driveway because that's what he really wants. But you know what, like, I didn't even own a spray tank until last year. I had a little port spray bottle, right? Every once in a while I do use a backpack sprayer, but I'm putting probiotics in that, right? I'm trying to up life, create life, support life, right? The last thing I want to do is get out there and spray poison. And I've seen this actually at three different properties this year. Two of my clients have asked me to spray, and I did spray, is uh, on hollies. Anyone noticed uh, what might look like a, a mold problem on hollies? You noticed this recently? Sooty mold is what it is. It's actually a uh, sort of byproduct of an, an insect what it gives off, and then the, um, so there's a mold problem, right? So my clients noticed that. Really, it's like, well, to me, and so I did spray insecticidal soap on it, but, you know, talking with the guy, this is a guy at Extension, Welcome County Extension, his suggestion, just get out a water hose. Spray the water hose on there as high pressure as you can, right? But, I and I think that a deeper problem, right, is, well, those hollies weren't pruned, they weren't fertilized, 
there was an incredible amount of dead wood on them, wasn't good air circulation, so it's like, and I think in a lot of ways what I'm getting around to is a foundational idea, right? We need to create health, right? If we have this philosophy, this idea, that we live in a healthy world, we are healthy, or, and it's also sort of a way of saying, well, the glass is half full, right? If we don't look at the world as like, I'm gonna go out and you know, control it and do all these things to it, but like, we're a part of it, and we're part of something that's good and beautiful, and in general, it supports health, right? If that's our approach, like how could we apply poison? How could we apply toxic things to it? Because, as Patrick pretty eloquently talked about, it's like we're talking about balance, right? Which is the next idea that I wanted to introduce, and this is something Patrick didn't bring up. So, there's a sort of, within this like, ideas of ecology, there's a term called dynamic equilibrium. Does that ring a bell for anyone here? Dynamic equilibrium? Yeah? Anyone know anything about it? <laughs> so, how about E.O. Wilson? Anybody know E.O. Wilson? Read his work? Right. So one of his graduate students was a guy named MacArthur, right? <clears throat> basically what MacArthur did is he went to the mangroves, and basically he could look at an island, small island, so we're talking about island biogeography, right? Which to me is like really helpful for thinking about habitats, right? And so what he did is he could then predict, based on the size of a habitat, based on an island, the amount of species that would be there, right? So if there's only one mangrove, maybe there's two or three herbaceous plants, and there's probably 15 to 20 insects, right? You can't tell you exactly, you can't predict what 15 species of insects are there, but there will be 15 species of insects, right? And we can make that larger, right? So imagine there's 40 mangroves, and we're talking about multiple acres. Well, then there also will be other herbaceous plants. There may be reptiles or amphibians and birds, and but there'll also be, instead of just 15 or 20 insects, maybe there's 200 species of insects, right? But are you with me so far? So, you know what MacArthur did and how he figured all this out? He sprays a chemical in there, right? Inventories everything that falls out. It's killed, right? It's dead. It's repopulated, right? It may not be the exact same 10 or 15 or 20 insects, but there's going to be 10 or 15 or 20 insects on that island, right? So there's this idea that there is equilibria out there, right? Unless we manipulate it, or unless we manipulate it over and over and over again, right? That's when we'll see, well, Maybe there's only three or four species in that island of habitat. So I use like the theoretical mangroves to also think about like our backyards as our little islands that we steward, right? Okay. So some of you may have heard Dylan speak at the last um, panel about permaculture, which I would say like I'm certainly informed by and trained by. And I think largely these are things that Patrick was saying as well that. I think that's almost the last thing we ended with, is that we need to observe and interact in our landscapes, right? And so I, I forget what he said, we need to perfect the art of puttering in our gardens, right? So, but if we see like, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna completely be in control of it and I'm gonna kill this thing, I think that's the wrong approach, right? If there's a fungus, I'm gonna spray fungicide. If there's an insect, I'm gonna spray insecticide. It's like, let's go observe the beauty and the like magic and alchemy of what it is. And then I think a related permaculture principle is small and simple solutions, right? So let's take those small and simple solutions, like knocking off those bugs into soapy water. Pretty small and simple solutions. The broader work that I'm trying to do it's not just edible landscapes. I want to deepen all of our relationships with our landscapes, right? And our work with all of our landscapes is always a work in progress. So, you know, the landscape out here behind the uh, Chamber of Commerce, it didn't look like this six or eight years ago. It was a construction site, right? And it continues to evolve and it will always change. Right. 
with some of my clients, I'll, I can very clearly say that I there's one, I can boil down some tension that we have. Is to find this balance between aesthetics, the way things look, and ecological function, right? So, Patrick talked about like perfectly cleaning up the garden at the end of the year. Well, that might serve some aesthetic value that we have, but it might not serve the ecological function of that garden. So those overwintering, in, overwintering insects then don't have habitat. We've lost those within our systems. I find this over and over again with my clients is that they want it to look a certain way. And I, I mean, I think I have this issue with myself also. Like, I have this idea of what our landscape should look like. I think we all have it, right? It's like, maybe we want neat edges. Well, those neat edges is, may not be what we want. Maybe we want ugly edges. That's where there's great diversity, right? Maybe we need to change our aesthetics. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. But I think there's a few permaculturists amongst us that are trying to do that. Um, I, I think as uh, Patrick mentioned, most of our crops can sustain, he mentioned 40%, 20 to 30% damage, it really will have very little impact on yields. So like, if there's a little holes in, in foliage, it's not that big of a deal. We can accept that. Um, yeah, and then I think two authors, just to throw these out there, and you know, Patrick's brought both these folks to town recently, is Elaine Ingham and Michael Phillips, to look into some of their work about soil and holistic orcharding. I think they're like really doing some amazing work. It's really inspiring. So I want to share a few other anecdotes. So I run, I tend to run, and it doesn't matter, I can go in two different loops, or about three mile loops from my house. And if I go to the left, I live in Mars Hill in Madison County. And Wait. all right. <laughs> so if I go up to the end of my road and take a left, and then another left, I'll pass acres and acres and acres of corn. To me, I was like so excited over the winter, right? Amazing cover crop out there, right? Rock, rye, winter wheat. Crimson clover all mixed in. It was just like this beautiful, awesome, right? Not long after that, or earlier this spring, it's like, oh, well, it's all brown. Well, and now it's like, wow, the corn's just growing up. It's like amazing. It's like fantastic, right? It's unbelievable, <laughs> right? But, and what I realized is that, like, it's, you know, it's, Roundup, that's what all that's about. Um, and so I, I think it really was in a film last week, but so part of the challenge that we have with insects and insect population is that in those farm fields that used to sustain weeds, that used to sustain pollinators and bees, like we're talking about deserts now. Yeah. The only thing that's alive there is corn. Yeah. Um, I, I do spray BT from time to time. I, I saved a specimen $180 fancy dwarf spruce by spraying BT. I mean, it was soft-bodied insects. The first application didn't do it. I went back and sprayed a second time, right? I once bid on doing landscaping at a doctor's office, right? A dermatologist's office. And I said, you know, I think you can share with your customers that you're going to take an organic approach to your landscaping. And I told you know, give them a big fancy bit. I told them all the things we were going to do and how it was going to be a little different than their, you know, their, their current maintenance crew. The problem is that my, that annual bid for me was $10,000. The guys that are working with now, now great, they're out there spraying, right? It's $3,000. So, you know, I didn't get that contract. I don't necessarily want that contract either, but, and so, you know, to me, I'm, if I'm other, it'd be great to have a dermatologist office as a client, right? But I think that, and so what I'm getting around to is that there is this, ch an economical challenge, a labor challenge, really, in terms of maintaining landscapes to an aesthetic we want, and there's this cheat, right? We'll spray chemicals, right? 
cheap in the short term, really expensive in the long term when those like costs are externalized and they, they turn up as cancers and you know, other health problems that we have. Um, yeah, so another client yesterday sends me these series of text messages and pictures and there's a fungus growing on hardwood mulch. Should I remove it? <laughs> sure, you can, but I mean, just <clears throat> that's what happens, right? Woody material is broken down by fungus. That's fungus's function within the ecosystem. I mean, using largely um, the prescriptive formula that Michael Phillips puts out there, right, in a holistic orchard in Madison County that we've designed and installed over the past year. And my client also has made a relationship with some beekeepers, and so they're keeping bees there. And my concern is that there's predominant winds that are going towards those beehives. And I asked the beekeeper who was there, she was working with the bees, and I said, do you know about Neem's impact on bees? But she does, right? So previously, I mean, the previous one of these sessions, Phyllis had talked about actually neem having negative impacts on honeybees. So I'm applying neem in a pretty small concentration, similar to what Patrick said before, with molasses, soap, fish, kelp, you know, all, all. everything else is probiotic. The only sort of antibiotic component in there is neem, right? But my question to this, I mean, and I'm talking about this as a I'm not gonna spill this lady's name out there, but like this is a lady who's like really involved in beekeeping in Western North Carolina. Like she didn't know about me and its impacts on bees. So I feel like I need to do more research on it, but my concern is when I'm spraying with a 50 foot hose, 40 gallon spray tank, and the drift of that directly onto the beehives, the last thing I wanna do is um, have a negative impact on these beehives. So, I will uh, end with some pro-holistic approaches that we use in our landscaping. And these are all pretty simple, you've already heard them before. Um, we use good mulches, we compost, we're going for diversity, we encourage rotation, um, we do foliar sprays, probiotics increase fungal and bacterial life on foliage. Like that's what I want to happen. We minimize tillage. Um, we do existing plant inventories for clients. So like, there's a lot of people moving here to Western North Carolina that have no idea what's growing in their landscapes. And a lot of it's really cool stuff. Um, and we do try to leave some of those spent plants standing in the fall and over the winter. Right, so we're not going for that perfect manicured brown sea of mulch in someone's front yard. Um, and I, I'm going to end with, uh, I think, two other things, which is, this is the fourth, I guess I'll ask you a question. How many of you have attended all four of these sessions in the series? <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, it's a pretty small group of us, but... I think that we've had like some really phenomenal presentations. I think we've all learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been a lot of information to take in on Friday nights. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it sort of leads me to a question, which I think Mariel sort of already started to answer, but is, is how do we keep moving forward? Like how do we take this energy and momentum to what are our next steps? Um, I'll leave it at that. I apologize for some redundancy with what Patrick um, put forward, um, but I think, like I said, I think we come from a similar school of thought. And Sunil, I don't know if we've left much space for you. <laughs> but I'm sure you're <laughs> 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 <laughs>